Hi everyone, uh, my name is Henry. I'm a maintainer on the Babel project. I'm here to just share some thoughts and experiences about what it's like to be a maintainer. You could think of this talk as XKCD 2347 expanded upon as a talk and going into how open source can be seen as kind of like a microcosm of our greater digital culture. So I don't have like a grand theory of open source. I'm just sharing some experiences and kind of what does it feel like on the inside to be that random person that has been maintaining something for a long time. Think of it as a phenomenology of open source. You know, one way to look at open source can be as a supply chain. From the company's point of view, you can see these dependencies as risks. Anything you rely on becomes a liability and every company is using open source. So why do we assume that these projects will continue to last? There's a sense where you're already relying on all these projects and trusting the people behind them to maintain them. And you think about it, the reason why open source works at all is because you don't have to know who these people are. So this question is interesting because we kind of outsource and we defer our responsibility to these other people. Sometimes they're unknown. Coding allows us to kind of abstract away, not having to think about implementations. And open source in some sense does the same thing, except it hides our dependencies and it also hides the people behind them. And so I guess maybe I just like to argue that those people matter. And so you can think of open source as infrastructure. I like the metaphor that Nadia makes in her paper, Roads and Bridges, right? There's a lot of labor that is being done for this digital infrastructure that we have. I think that Heartbleed was kind of a wake up call for a lot of people in 2014. It was interesting seeing that the, the project for us, OpenSSL only had an annual budget of $2,000 and a lot of companies had to band together to help fund that effort for a few years. Even in JavaScript, we've had many incidents of, I guess, seeing how, where the supply chain runs. And my, my own Twitter handle is just based off of this leftpad thing that happened. And there's a lot you could say about leftpad, how it's only 11 lines that maybe we didn't need to have that many dependencies, but that's kind of what has been happening in our culture of not really understanding how they work or not understanding who's behind them. Event stream was a similar thing that happened in 2016, except in this case, it was Dominic who has a lot of packages decided to give the publishing rights to someone that was contributing, but that person ended up trying to upload malicious code. And so the, diff the thing is that it's easy to blame someone for saying like, well, why didn't you check? who that person was, but like he was saying that it's, it's normal for people to share access rights and to allow people to contribute back. And it's kind of hard to vet who is wor worthy of being trusted. If someone works on a project and like in his case for a few weeks and they seemed quote unquote normal, then it would be hard to say that he made the wrong decision because that sort of thing happens all the time. And so this this trust that's happening, it, it's happening at every level and it's, yeah, it's hard to know like what exactly the best scenario is in terms of how many barriers we want to create to allow people to contribute back. Yeah. It's a hard balance. And this is just for like small projects, right? I, I think that open source is such a big word. It's kind of hard to know what exactly we mean and GitHub doesn't necessarily help with that because everything looks the same. You know, in this example, I just found like a random project I had from a long time ago for a hackathon. I'm never going to work on this project again. I don't expect anyone or even want anyone to contribute. It's kind of there as a time capsule or, you know, you, you make something for your resume or something, or just an old project that you want to just put up there just so people can see, but you're not expecting collaboration. So that's different. Well, the source is open, but nobody is planning on working on it. You know, a repo could be like a garden or it could be, you know, archived. It's, it's not actually being used or dependent on at all. So there's no expectation of funding or any of that stuff. And no one's feeling entitled to anything. And Babel 
and like other projects that could be more like a whole town where like there's not a lot of people working it, but a lot of people are using it and then you can get up to a level of like node or tensorflow and also a lot of people working on it too that are maybe full-time paid all of these different kinds of projects have different feelings of obligations right if it's smaller maybe you feel like it's not that bad if you're not working on it but if you're someone like Sindre who has hundreds of npm packages that he maintains then then you might still feel obligated to work on all of them a little bit but it would be a lot harder to ask for like funding because that each individual project doesn't seem as necessary as like a big one and so yeah this this feeling of obligation is mostly self-imposed but i think that it's fostered through our environment and the workflows that we create trying to check all your github notifications just like your email and your twitter and your slack and your discord stack overflow just seeing how many issues are in the queue or how many pull requests this is not even something that's unique to open source we all partake in this ritual of you know internalizing these habits you know, we have to answer our ringtone. We swipe up to refresh. There's the infinite doom scrolling, the buzzing of your you know watch. And it feels like you just, you have to answer these things. And, you know, we learn sometimes to, you know, create filters, lock the phone or do not disturb stuff like that. But ultimately I think we still feel that sense of like guilt. And, you know, I think that's not that different from other habits that are created and the environments that are there. So one example would be in the mall. That's a great example of ritual as well. You know, back when we used to go to them, it was a place that was enclosed with no windows so that you lose your sense of time. There's no instructions on necessarily what to do, but you're kind of guided by all the different shops and even the, the mannequins that tell you how to dress or what to buy or how your life would be better if you do it this way. And so we're, yeah, we're constantly shaped by the environment around us. Even if, you know, you could say that it's easy to just stop or it's easy to just quit doing open source, you can run away. But I guess I'm just saying that like that feeling is still there and it makes it really hard to make what is considered a simple decision. It's not easy. Nadia Ekbal had this book called Working in Public written last year, and she has a great two by two breakdown of how some projects work and the low contributor growth high user growth section she calls a stadium and it's funny because the example there is Babel which is the project that I work on and usually I guess this is the type of project that I'm speaking of when I think about the issues that I'm feeling at least where there's not a lot of people working on the project but there's higher and higher amounts of people using it and so as those users scale up that it's almost inevitable that you will it will lead to burnout because even though the code is zero marginal cost you can download it and that doesn't affect anything the the cost comes at the attention of the people working on it the maintainer's attention where you know that's obviously limited and the scale of the requests that come in not necessarily downloads but people reporting issues people requesting features chatting on various social media um, those things can't scale if the number of people don't grow either. Um, and it's not that different from any other kind of content creation where you give something away for free and you feel obligated to continue uploading YouTube videos or whatever to maintain a certain pace. And I think it maybe it also leads to pointing out that, you know, these projects may not stay in the, the different sections that they're from. Maybe a lot of projects start off as a toy where you're just doing it for fun, you're not expecting anyone to use it, and maybe they feel like they need it to turn it into a stadium or a federation just because other people are doing it. People should feel free to work on open source the way they want, but then when they get to a stadium, like when I joined Babel, it was already popular. I wasn't trying even to make it hyped up or anything. I was just like, oh, I want to help out. And then that opportunity might have eventually turned into a sense of obligation because maybe you feel like you're the only one that can work on it even though that's not true yeah so there's a lot of idealism in open source that on what open source should be and how it's actually like there's this assumption that uh, everything is just 
getting to collaborate with anyone in the world when in reality maybe you feel pretty alone even if you are working on a team um there's this assumption that you have to respond and help everyone that shows up that you're always on call there's no room to take a break and so you just feel like this loss of control and i'm not like saying that this is new or anything it's not a re new revelation i've gone on and off on dealing with burnout and this loss of my boundaries and maybe you feel even worse because you know that you're still choosing to do open source like no one's forcing you to do it maybe it might not be necessarily your job you could do something else and yeah that guilt interesting enough hasn't really gone away even in the different situations i felt it when i was doing it for fun outside of work i felt it when i was doing work on open source halftime and then now i still feel it when i'm getting paid to do it through donations even people that are working on it full-time i think at, you know like say facebook or microsoft i'm sure they still feel some sense of obligations to work overtime or on the weekend or to answer someone's question and yet they're still getting paid for it i guess it doesn't necessarily make that go away this need to do more and more work leads to even more and more work that nolan wasn't even going into the parts about getting funded but just that he was doing this in his free time and i don't need to bring up too many examples of all the times that users have been entitled to ask maintainers to fix their bugs and stuff like that but again something i i've been thinking about a lot is this idea that you know we have a lot of good intentions coming in as a maintainer and then that leads to maybe a sense of you know your own entitlement of feeling jaded and expecting something in return and yeah i think everyone should be treated fairly and and nicely but this you know this quote from the dark knight that you're trying so hard to help people and maybe in the end you find yourself that you become the evil one you know the phrase the road to hell is paved with good intentions that seems to come up a lot or at least i feel that way you know there's sort of this backlash that you get in the open source world if you don't keep everything open and I, it's interesting finding like a project like sqlite where the code is open source and yet they don't actually ask for contributions at all because they want to make sure that everything is in public domain and it's perfectly in their right to not be so open in terms of the collaboration aspect but maybe this is okay because they've always done it that way if you know we decided to do this then it might seem different or bad. One example I'm reminded of is how Vue 3, at least in the JavaScript world, they basically made that closed source in a way. They worked on it um, by themselves, worked on, iterated it, and then they presented it to the public, or sort of similar with React hooks. But we have this backlash where people expect everything to be open, including what you're thinking, even though you're not even sure what to do next. And this funding issue isn't even specific to a small project but even mozilla right with mdn this essay is pointing out that it's like similar to applauding healthcare workers instead of actually funding them that this work that is so important could be done by volunteers when in reality it should be paid for it's not like anyone here had bad intentions but maybe it doesn't get to the root of the issue that this important work if it is deemed to be important you should be compensated in the end maybe all we have is guilt as maintainers fat had this talk in 2013 where he creates this metaphor of this cute puppy syndrome where open source is deemed to be something that we have to take care of that's alive that maybe it grows old and we are afraid of it dying and so and then we keep taking care of more and more puppies and then we're not we're afraid to give it to other people because we feel responsible yeah, I think a lot of open source is prone to this quantification of how many stars you have, how many issues you have, how many downloads you have. You know, we have somehow 100 million downloads a month and with this many dependencies. And so you, it's easy to focus so much on all these things, chasing numbers and how many sponsors and users that we have, that it, it can lead to a lot of burnout. And so I, I think of this Goodhart's law where when we target a certain measure, it ceases to be good. 
uh, whether it's search engine optimization or how many papers are cited or your code coverage or your stars, there's an overemphasis sometimes on that measurement. I think that this is epitomized in this, this picture, right? The thing that we think of is the contribution graph, but it, a lot of times it's funny as a joke, but also it, maybe it leads to a sense of dread where, you know, you can see it on the bathroom and the restaurant and that's really cool. But you know, what happens when you look at someone else's contribution graph and it's really easy to judge someone by seeing, oh, they had a lot of contributions. That must mean they've been doing a lot of work. We don't know. It's hard to say, is it because they lost their job or maybe they got a job or maybe they were just busy with other things. Monica has a great picture here that does annotate how she interprets her help contribution graph. It's a cool artifact of just seeing how your year went in review. But Jen, instead, she got to annotate how her GitHub graph looked and seeing that just depending on different problems at work or you had a new job or you got pregnant or you were sick, there's different reasons why the GitHub contribution graph isn't all green, basically. And so I'm also reminded of a quote from Ivan Illich um, and bringing up this measurement in terms of what grade level you're at, that somehow dropping out might be worse than not going to school at all because it just makes you feel bad that you didn't uh, make it. And maybe that's the same thing when, you know, people are trying to apply for a job and the first thing we do is look at their GitHub and it's empty, then people will assume that you're not um, contributing to open source and that's like bad or something. I think it's good that we can use things like all contributors to add in contributions that aren't just code and to acknowledge, you know, whether it's docs or uh, giving talks or making a video, that those are all things that are valued and can be valuable for an open source project. Or we just decide to rebel against that entirely. We can make programs that automatically commit for us because we know that it's absurd to judge someone based on their commit history. And this is a funny way of looking at it, but yeah, I think it gets at some issues that is just more subtle in terms of the graph. Nothing's wrong with having a streak or trying to maintain writing code all the time, but sometimes it makes us look differently at other programmers. Yeah. So if there's something wrong in the technical system, then we default now to the idea that we are the problem, not the machine, not the algorithm, not the program, but rather ourselves. In seeing how Amazon is planning to create algorithms to make it so that people can be more optimized is literally treating people like, like robots, that we will become like machines. And I like automation just as much as any other programmer, you know, writing and using bots to make it so I don't have to do the same tasks over and over. But, you know, it seems like these pursuits can some, can lead to counterproductive results, right? The means become ends. And another thing that I've been feeling trapped in is this commodification of everything, you know, not just, you know, in open source, but, you know, the content is king right now, right? Making, you know, whether it's YouTube videos or NFTs, we're commodifying ourselves. It feels weird to even think of open source sometimes as a liability because it, it's sort of like the idea of HR calling people resources. And I find that maybe this whole Patreon model is similar to the gig economy where, you know, our time has become money and I have to spend some amount of effort so that some person will give me a few dollars for doing X, X task. It's hard to focus on writing code, you know, or doing a lot of these things in open source because you're not even sure if you're going to have enough money to sustain yourself um, in the next few months. And then that kind of builds up on itself because you're worrying that you can lose this money. If anything, you realize that the more code that you write, the less money you make because writing code doesn't lead to more donations necessarily. If anything, it might lead to less because people are think that you're okay with making so little in the first place. If you think about it, not a lot of software engineers would 
could consider even joining a startup or company that makes less money than just one person at Google in, in the first place. And even when it feels like things can be entertaining or fun to create content, it's really demanding on your time. Your, your time and your life becomes monetized. Yeah, it's never more true that time is money, right? And you see that people are trying to all stream on Twitch and they all have no viewers. And it's like, what are we doing this for? Nothing's wrong with trying to attempt it in the first place, but you've seen plenty of videos talking about YouTube burnout or Twitter burnout. It feels like everything has to become a business or selling a course, creating a consultancy, making a certificate for your project or raising your VC money to create a service. Um, these are all things other than working on the code directly because writing the code directly doesn't actually get money. There's a pressure, Lord, I guess, to escalate that, that it feels like the end goal of every open source project has to become a SaaS company. Not that that's wrong, but maybe that doesn't fit every single project. I don't really see how Babel would make sense to become a service. And I think people are are doing a great job, whether it's like Apollo or Deno or Vercel, De Gatsby. But I don't think, you know, every project should be doing that or feels like they need to do that. Yeah, it just feels like the solution of every problem is to become a giant company that tells everyone to install their app and build in their ecosystem. But it feels like the human is being left behind. And I do want to get back to this feeling that Craig mentions that, you know, I can write code and I can feel like I'm in control and it's fun and there's a sense of joy. But I find, like how Sterling says, like a lot of coding isn't coding at all. And I guess I admit now that even though she's mentioning that for early career developers, they feel like they're not being productive when they're not writing code. I feel that right now, even though I've been working on this for many years now, I still feel that way. Illich talks about this idea that you know, the tools that we make are tend to be made to work for us uh, rather than to work with us. He speaks of this word conviviality, which I really like. He talks about this idea that instead of relying on services and products, how do we create tools so that we can be autonomous and to help one another out such that we can be interdependent, that we help our communities rather than outsource everything to some product, some commodity. And he also has this concept of shadow work, which speaks of the kind of work that is inherent to work. It's a shadow of what's needed, yet it's not considered work. I think from an economist point of view, those are just externalities. They aren't priced in, but there's a lot of work that maybe we has its own, I guess he would call dignity that maybe we don't need to, or we shouldn't price. Because, you know, whether it's the commute time, are we going to start tracking that? Even you know, if you think about childcare or parenting, it's a similar thing where it's like it's necessary and needed. And maybe we should pay for those things. But at the same time, maybe there's something about it that needs to be thought differently. And so I go back to this picture again. I don't know, it's weird. I feel trapped in a jail of my own making, right? I'm free to leave open source whenever. But yet this feeling of obligation and quantification, commodification leads to just be not sure what to do. You lose your agency. And I guess the only thing you can do is you feel like you can leave. I'm not sure what the solution is really. It feels like the onus falls on the maintainer all the time to support yourself, to raise enough money, to write the code in the first place, to fix your issues, to make a new feature, to make a roadmap. It kind of seems inevitable that it's going to feel overwhelming, that you're going to feel bad not writing code, doing the fundraising, and then you're not really going to enjoy fundraising because that's not what you're used to and that's not what you wanted to do in the first place. What DJ tries to say in his talk about open source beyond the market is appealing. It's like Illich's desire to find not alternative economics, but an alternative to economics itself. The idea that open source thinking can help us to move away from this quid pro quo transactional way of thinking, of doing things for its own sake, that has its own dignity and enjoyment 
the realization of Matthew 10, 8, freely you have received, freely give. But it feels like it's only possible because you work at a company that sponsors open source work full time, or you have a full time job that supports your free time. It's still important to lower the barriers so that not just the people that are doing open source now can continue to do it, but that more people can do it that didn't feel like they could or have the privilege to do it in the first place. It feels like our machines are becoming more and more like people with GPT-3 and all that. But then at the same time, it feels like we are becoming more and more like machines. We treat our tools like resources. We treat the environment as a resource. And eventually we treat people like sophisticated machines. And ultimately then you see yourself as part of a system. You see yourself as the cog in the machine. In this case, it's the supply chain. Is that the right metaphor for us to conceive of ourselves? And I, I just know that going ahead to do work isn't going to solve the problem. Simply continuing on our way to build or to code is maybe what led us to this situation in the first place. So maybe the only thing that I need to learn is just to stop.